Good morning, and welcome to online worship at Chelsea First United Methodist. My name is Rodney Gasway, and I am so very pleased to be able to share the Word of God with you this morning. You know, this is one of my favorite times of year. It's a great time to go out and take a hike or take a ride on my motorcycle. But as we begin today, I have a question for you. Have you slowed down enough to recognize the beautiful, how beautiful the leaves of the trees are and all their colorful magnificence? How about silencing your mind enough to enjoy the sounds of children playing? Have you taken time to recognize all the members of this congregation who live their lives in such a way that glorifies God? See, in God's abundance, we are blessed in so many ways. And it is my hope that you are taking that time to recognize the abundance of the many gifts that we have been given by God. Enjoy worship today and do your best to enjoy the gifts that you have been blessed with. Good morning and welcome to Sunday Morning Church. My name is Jerry Betker. I'm a member of the Finance Committee here at Chelsea First. And I'd like to take a moment to share with you the reasons why I give to church. Giving to church started for me many, many years ago. Growing up in rural northern Illinois, Sunday church was a fixture for our lives. Even though the drive was 22 miles into town, our family was faithful and rarely missed a Sunday. Mom and Dad stressed that this is where we needed to be on Sunday. Worshipping, going to Sunday school, praying, and giving thanks for all the wonderful gifts that had been bestowed on our family. We were still young yet, didn't have the means to put our own offering into the plate, but Mom was there to provide us with dimes so that we could put a, put a dime in the collection plate when it passed through the pew. Later, when we got older, we started making our own way, as Dad called it, and earning our own money. We were given a rather firm suggestion as to what to do with our earnings. We were told that God deserved 10% of our money, our earnings, before we even spent any of it on ourselves. First fruits is what I think Mom called it. Mom also reinforced for us the attitude of giving. She said that God loves a cheerful giver. And of course, she had the Bible to back her up. 
from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 9, starting with verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So given this direction, and armed with a promise of good things to come, we continued steadfast in our giving. Once we started using our, our own money, we did ask what the church did with the money they collected. Mom and Dad were ready to share with us how the money, money, was, money was spent. Dad was an elder at church, and he had details on where the money was being distributed. He did tell us about the money that was being sent to the international mission effort in, in Africa, and also the monies that were being sent to a ministry mission down in the city of Chicago. And of course, there were the regular monthly expenses that were incurred in keeping the church open, things like the utilities, building maintenance, and paying the staff and the pastors. Thus, at a young age, we developed a sense of purpose for our giving. And although mom really never intended Jesus' message of the last day of reckoning to be a threat to us, I've always remembered Jesus' words very clearly. Matthew 25, 34 through 40. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I needed clothes and you gave me a shirt. I was sick and you comforted me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And the righteous will say, Lord, when did we do all these things? And the king will reply, whatever you have done to one of the least of these brothers, you have done it unto me. This message has stuck with me into my, into my, into my entire adult life. For a long time, I looked at giving as an obligation. But I am happy to say that my perspective on giving has changed. Our church here in Chelsea is filled with the Holy Spirit. I come here to have my spirit lifted in a way that has never been lifted before. Much like when we need to plug in our mobile phones or our tablets to recharge the battery, so I must get my spirit recharged here among my brothers and sisters in Christ and to hear the message of salvation proclaimed on a regular basis. And the spirit moves this congregation in so many ways. When Chelsea first provides breakfast for the community, we are feeding the hungry. When we see our young people volunteer to help our brothers and sisters in Detroit or Jackson, they are carrying the spirit and message of God's love beyond the four walls of our church. When we contribute to local charities such as Faith in Action and other charitable causes, we are ministering to our brothers and sisters who are in need and less fortunate. When we donate unused clothing and shoes, we are helping to clothe our brothers and sisters. When we provide backpacks for school children in the community who are unable to afford them, we are witnessing by showing God's love and compassion to our brothers and sisters in need. I could go on and on because there are so many more activities that Chelsea First undertakes to do for others. So now, my gifts come out of the gratitude for all the blessings which God has provided me and my family, including the blessing of our church here in Chelsea and the people who inhabit it and who call it their church home. Because I have been given so much, I am motivated to share my blessings with others. This is my reason for giving. May God bless you and keep you today. Thanks be to God.
Grace, God's unmerited favor on a sinner like me. I grew up in the Methodist church, a progressive church, and as soon as I went left home, I walked away from the church. I had a good job, I had a beautiful wife, and things seemed to be going good, but I realized later that I had broken all Ten Commandments. Then we adopted kids, and those kids, by God's grace, asked, when are we going to church? landing me in this church in Jim Lorenz's Sunday school class. And then the stresses of raising kids took us on a marriage encounter weekend in the Methodist church. And that weekend got me, got me working, or us working, for the marriage encounter effort. And I got to see Christians, Methodist Christians, who believed in God's word and lived their lives for him which got me reading the Bible, actually not reading it, but on my long commute listening as I drove uh, to work to the Bible every day and listening to Christian radio as I drove home. And then something even more amazing happened, and that is I heard the gospel, salvation by grace, and I realized that while growth in Christ is going to be a progressive thing, Submission to Christ is a one-time commitment forever. It, you can't be part Christian. It's a one or it's an all or nothing thing. So I driving down I-94 in my white escort station wagon committed my life to Jesus Christ. It seemed like a big sacrifice to me. Tears were running down my cheeks, but it was the best decision I ever made. And then we had the wonderful, I started studying the Bible more intently, and we had the wonderful opportunity to go to Australia, where there was more chance for study, more service, and a godly church where the gospel was uplifted. And then we came back here, more chances to study and read God's word, more teaching, more Bible learning and classes. And then that real opportunity to serve as missionaries in Africa by God's grace. Uh, and not just the chance to study God's word, but the chance to do it as an assignment. My responsibility was to teach God's word and to study it every day. And then those Bible studies with people who had committed their lives to Christ. There's nothing better. And then coming back here, when my father died and uh, we took care of my mother, going back to that same church, now very much humbled, but with a godly pastor leading that church, one steeped in God's Word. So, chances again to study God's Word, to read it, to teach it, coming back to Michigan, uh, getting a chance to teach here and study God's Word, uh, then the chance to see in Judson Collins, as we volunteered, people who dedicated their lives for low pay and hard work to teach the gospel to the children of the church. What a wonderful experience. Since then, there's been lots of emphasis in us on uh, the Methodist church, promoting God's word in the church. And so my message for you 
is surrender to God, study his word, and you will find your life changed like mine. The, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. What you sow is what you reap. The one who sows to the flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. The one who sows to the spirit will reap eternal life. At this time, please join me for a moment of reflection and prayer. Are you suffering from COVID fatigue? Well, many are. But Scripture tells us in Galatians, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap the harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever you have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone especially to those in the family of faith. So please pray with me. Lord God, you have blessed us and continue to bless us in so many ways. Your abundance of gifts we receive is too plentiful to account. From the colors of the fall and the warm sun to being able to spend time with our loved ones and everything in between as well as everything beyond. We give you thanks. Please open our hearts and our minds and grant us the wisdom that we may recognize these many things. Give us the courage to lift up your name as well as these blessings as we proclaim your glory to the world. We give you thanks and we ask that you hear our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ. At this time, let us say together the prayer that the Lord has given us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the and the glory forever. Amen.
Greetings, brothers and sisters. Grace to you and peace in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. I invite you to recall a time when you felt the presence of God. Where were you? Were others there? As you reflect on these things, I light a candle. Our theme word for today is presence. Susan Adam Rita invites us to experience the presence of God. Good morning, friends. My name is Susan Adam Rita, and today I want to bring a message to you, especially to my little friends. We'll talk today about the presence of God. How do I know that God is present? How do I know what God looks like? Hmm, have you ever asked yourself that question? Well, God is expressed in many forms. We, for instance, can find God in nature. Look at those beautiful flowers. Aren't they gorgeous? You can also find God. Have you noticed the trees changing colors? Aren't they magnificent? You can find God's expression in the sun, in nature per se, or in your friends, in your family, in people you love. Because God is always expressed in the beauty of the here and now. So sometimes, even if you don't see something, it doesn't mean it's not there. And Philippe will help me to do a little experiment to show you that even though you can't see it, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So make sure, friends, God's presence is always with you. In one way or another form, his presence is always there. Our Bible passage today is from Exodus chapter 33, beginning with verse 12. We read a dialogue between Moses and God. Moses was the leader of the people of Israel, leading them from captivity as slaves in Egypt to their new home. In this passage, we find a leader on the edge. Leadership is difficult and their journey had been hard. We see a rising in Moses, a creeping suspicion that he wasn't given enough information to do the mon monumental task before him. He wasn't given enough help, wisdom, insight, grace, whatever, to be the leader that was needed. I read this passage from a paraphrase in dialogue form. Moses said to God, I've gotten the short end of the stick again. You gave me this job, but you didn't say how I'm supposed to do it or who's going to help me do it or even for sure what, is, what we are supposed to do now. I have no roadmap, no itinerary, no clue what is next. All I have is this vague sense of call and of the fact that you seem to like me for some reason. And besides, this is your miss to fix, not mine anyway. God says, Moses, I'm here. Take it easy. Moses says, well, duh, you're here. You better be here since this is your idea anyway. But I need more than that, way more. God says, okay, because I like you. Because I told you my name. Okay? Moses is a bit stunned by this turn of conversation, and he whispers, then show me your glory. Moses was longing for presence, God's presence. To know and be known can get us through a lot. Through the difficult days ahead, the complicated questions, the bone-crushing rejection, the weightiness of matters that overwhelm us on a regular basis to walk in the confidence that we are known by God, that God walks with us, is essential in our faith journey. 
Each of us longs for that sense of presence with God to do whatever tasks are before us, parenting, in our intimate relationships, in our work, our school, our volunteering, even as we provide leadership within this faith community. Susan and Felipe show us that it is God's very nature to be present. Good morning, everybody. So today, Felipe is here to help me make an experiment. We have a whole bowl full of water, an empty cup. Can you show the cup, Philippe, to see it's all empty, nothing inside, and a piece of paper. Now, Philippe, can you fold the paper or, I mean, just, yeah, and put it on the bottom of the cup, stick it in there. Now, if you turn the cup, does it fall off? No, like this. Oops. So you got to put it really tight in so it doesn't fall off. Put it in the bottom. Oh, okay, let's try with another paper. Let's see. Get another piece of paper. Maybe not two. Don't be okay. Two? All right. That's good enough. The discussion very in. And so we are going to just wait, dunk the whole cup into the water, into the full bowl of water. But obviously not throw it in. Obviously not throwing it, just very fast, try to put it in. Leave it in there, so it's all in the water. Now bring it up. Now check what happened to the paper. Oops. It's dry. Is it dry? Yes, yeah, it's dry. Why do you think that happened? It's because the air was in the cup and it pushed against the water. Can you see the air? No. No. And that is like God, right? Can you see God? No. He's invisible, but he is? Everything. Everywhere. So he's there, even though we can't see it. That's like the air in the cup. Thank you, Faye. Franciscan teacher and author Richard Rohr wrote, We cannot attain the presence of God because we're already in the presence of God. What is absent is awareness. Little do we realize that God's love is constantly maintaining us with every breath we take. As we take another and another, it means that God is present with us now and now and now and now. Moses knew that to become aware of the presence of God, you must spend time with God. God and Moses spent a lot of time in conversation like friends. Exodus 33, 11 says, God used to speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Continuing the paraphrase of the Bible passage, God says to Moses, I know you, Moses, and I like you. So here's what I'll do. I'll make all my goodness pass before you. It's just what you need. My goodness will equip you and fill you. On your own, the tasks before you are beyond you. But filled with my goodness, the impossible becomes possible. Filled with my goodness, you can lead these people. Filled with my goodness, God says to us, you can be the people I created you to be. We tend to think if we work hard enough, then we will be good. But that isn't how it works. Goodness is a gift. It is a blessing. It is the spirit at work in us. God blessed Moses on that mountaintop and God 
blesses us with God's presence, empowering us anytime we allow the Spirit to fill us and we become aware of that presence. Instead of alone in a crowd, we are filled with God's goodness. There are ways we cultivate awareness of God through a variety of practices, daily prayer and scripture reading, worship both personal and as we gather in community, silence, solitude, meditation, deep breathing, gratitude, holy communion, play a glass bead in my pocket from a baptismal renewal service filled with God's goodness lost in God's love. In God's presence, God's goodness, we grow beyond where we are now. We find that something more, something new, a love like no other, a love that can heal the world. In the goodness of God, who knows us by name, we press on as a community of faith, seeking to transform the world by drawing all people into the gracious love of God in Christ Jesus. We press on. Will you pray with me? Ever-present God, we give you thanks for your constant presence with us. Guide us to be more aware of your presence, that we might be assured of our place as your beloved people. Give us the freedom and courage to live a love like yours. This we pray in your holy name. Amen.
talked about the presence of God, one form you can talk to God is through prayer. So I have a little fun way to pray that I would like to teach you, and it's called the finger prayer. After every finger that we talk about, you can have a little pause and do your own prayer. So it goes like that. My thumb is small as it's plain to see. It's a reminder to pray for me. My pointing finger shows me where to go. I will pray for those who guide me as I grow. My middle finger stands so tall. I will thank God because he watches over all. Finger number four is weaker than the rest. Please God, care for those who need your rest. My very last finger is tiny like a child. I will pray for other kids across the whole world wild. Amen. Sisters and brothers, I offer you a very brief prayer, a word of invitation that you might want to include in your daily practice. Lord, come to me. My door is open. That simple phrase can be an opening, an awareness building moment for each of us to be attentive to God's presence with us, with each breath now and now and now god come to me my door is open may the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god and the empowerment of the holy spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and forevermore amen <music>